Hello and welcome to another episode of Guitar Night Live. I'm Daniel Jacobson. I founded Ultimate School of Music in Dublin, Ireland. And my guest tonight has achieved a huge amount in the guitar world. She's very well known for touring with Michael Jackson and Jeff Beck. She's also re released three solo albums, written two guitar books and created three courses and also is the creator of the incredible Guitar Cloud Symposium. So I'm really blown away to welcome and introduce you to Jennifer Batten. Now I have to unpin myself and let people in. Well, thank you. It, it, it's great to be here. And I apologize in advance because right now is when the gardener next door is using his leaf blower. <laughs> I mean, one of the last seminars I did, they, they decided to uh, chop down a tree next door right when the seminar started. So <laughs> these these are the unknowns of the virtual world. No worries. So, it happens every time, believe me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully, hopefully my dogs will behave. So Jennifer, when was the last time you performed live? You know, I had uh, I had three gigs since lockdown, and the first one was a twenty-five person maximum, and outdoors under a tent, and people were really spread out, and I hadn't played in so long, and you know the the, the lockdown was so stressful for everybody, especially musicians that lost all their work. It felt like an exorcism to get to play for people. It was just incredible, and you know I. I was playing at home, but that is not stage chops. And it, it I knew I wasn't 100%, but it felt great. I did another one outdoors at a winery. That was pretty cool, <laughs> except that was, oh my God. I spaced because it was the weekend that I first launched Guitar Cloud Symposium. And like a week before, I realized I double booked myself and I go, oh, my God. And it's the first time I work for this guy, so I can't cancel it. So the symposium ended at, uh, I think, 4 p.m. Uh, my time. And I just threw everything in the car and jetted down there and just barely got there in time. It was exhausting. <laughs> so I wouldn't recommend doing that. And uh, I don't think it's ever happened before and hopefully will never happen again. Um, and then the last one was a Christmas show. Last, uh, before lockdown, I did a series of like 25 Christmas shows, or twice on weekends. And I am not a fan of Christmas music, so that's saying a lot. <laughs> but I've been trying to figure out ways to travel less. And there's a guy in town that's been doing this Christmas show at a beautiful church downtown Portland for the better part of 30 years. And he's super popular and he fills it every time of uh, max capacity and so i was a guest that did i don't know half a dozen songs and this time it was virtual and filmed because we couldn't have an audience and i forgot how small the thing was and i was sitting there on stage going i am three feet away from singers and we don't have a vaccine yet <laughs> it was i should not have done that but i'm alive <laughs> crazy and have you got more gigs coming up now? Are they starting to be booked for? Yeah. Yeah. Another thing I did to, to try to travel less was I started a cover band locally. So we've got uh, our first gig is July 9th. Um, we got a bunch in August and then the makeup gigs. Makeup. I, I, yeah. yeah. I, I did a, um, four or five years now. I've been going to the, to the UK to play with a, a Michael Jackson tribute show. That's really fun, really great people. And obviously they, they had to cancel it and they've rebooked it several times. And so the next booking is for the first two weeks of August. So I, I hope it happens, but I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't. You, you never know. I mean, it, the news is week to week these days. Oh, the variant zombies are coming for us. <laughs> so is what it is. I mean, the musicians got to roll with it, right? Things happen. Flight connections don't happen, luggage gets lost, guitars get broken, and that's why we die young. And with the, all the change of pace and schedule and the not traveling this year, what what's your experience been like and what's your daily routine like? 
Well, <clears throat> ever since I decided to launch the Guitar Cloud Symposium, that's been it. It's I've never really had a, a business before outside of me just playing or playing with groups or something. So, man, it's a learning curve from hell, really. And I, I've finally, I would do what my friend calls panic postings, where I'd wake up and go, ah, there's not enough students, I'm going to make a video, I'm going to put it online, make graphics, and, you know, hours and hours and hours of your life you'll never get back, <laughs> go into promotion. Um, and I finally hired a marketer back in, I think, November, that he worked his magic and that made the numbers go through the roof as far as the social media kind of stuff. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. I, I, in a pandemic, I didn't think I would get any sponsors at all, and we ended up with 15. So there, there's been a lot of surprises. And one of the surprises was, you know, I thought we were going to do it organically where we pull from the fans of all the, the people that are teaching. And the original instructors were Neely Brosh, who was just a crazy monster player, incredible chops. Um, her Her latest thing is... She was supposed to play Coachella with Danny Elfman, who's done like a hundred film scores and was in Oingo Boingo. And that got canceled because of the pandemic. So they ended up doing a record where the 11th of every month they're releasing a new song. So it was Neely and Gretchen Men. And I had done a short tour with both of them a couple months before the pandemic. And I've toured with Vicky Genfan uh, a few times. I had a motor home I took around America, and then uh, I also toured with her in the Czech Republic. So I was thinking, these are people that I, that I know they're great players, I know I can get along with them, and I know they're workhorses, because that, that's something that's really important. Um, it's one thing to say you'll show up on Zoom, but to actually put in the work and create a course and have support materials for people to take away after the fact. Because the original model that I came up with was based on TED Talks, where you get these you know, TED Talks, you get speakers from all over the world and every genre. They have to take whatever they know, like some kind of rocket science, and distill it into 20 minutes of the best of. And so we each came up with six subjects that we were passionate about teaching. And in one hour, you can do three subjects and then a half hour Q&A period. And so that's what the weekend was. And you would get 24 modules of content from uh, tapping to theory to arpeggios to scales to this and that uh, percussive acoustic kind of stuff and uh, the thing that we did not expect was the alumni keep coming back like every month <laughs> and so we're going we can't teach what we taught last time so we're scrambling to put new courses together and now I just sent out an email yesterday and said you know uh, I need to get the schedule for June now, so start thinking about it. And it's we're coming up on a year, so it's okay to repeat, <laughs> you know, so people can actually take a breath and um, just go back and look at what you taught in August and refine it, make it different if you want to make improvements. And we're we're also talking now about taking some of the Zoom archives because I recorded everything only so we could have a look at it to improve it for future. But now we're looking at packaging it up and uh, like people in, um, <clears throat> we've had people as far as way, away as Zimbabwe, Mexico City, um, New Zealand, Australia. There was one guy that wrote to me last month and said, I really want to come, but I am not getting up at four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so it's just the time zone is just not going to work for him. So somebody like that having access to archives of the Zooms would be great. But the, the main focus, I want to have live interaction because there's a trillion DVDs out there or streams of people teaching and YouTubes and all that. But to have live guidance, live interaction with people, I think is really important and motivating. Yeah. It, and, and I'm hoping some people's brains are like mine. I mean, that's kind of a scary thought right there. But in that I have a really short attention span, and I have bought DVDs from years ago that I never even opened, you know? But if I'm paying for a course and I have to be there right then, that's there's some energy there that you can't package. Yeah, Plus, yeah, you're right. That's definitely the advantage. Definitely. Yeah. Plus, I'm doing like what you're doing and bringing in 
um, special guest for the, we have a rap party on the Monday night. It, let me back up a little bit. These, these four day events are a couple hours on Friday, which is orientation to get to know students and see where they're coming from. And I want the students to get to know each other as well. Um, Saturday, Sunday is content all day. And the Monday night is a rap party where <clears throat> people get sponsored giveaways. We've given away a bunch of different Luna guitars, Tonewood amps, we gave away a, a blue guitar amp one, straps and strings and t-shirts and all. I get to play Santa Claus. It's it's really fun. Then I sp spend the next three days at the post office. <laughs> you know, that's, that is really labor intensive. But it ends with a special guest. And I had... Um, just because I know these guys, I had Scott Henderson. I used to teach at Musicians Institute, and he was teaching across the hall from me. Andy Timmons, I did a tour with him. Uh, the next one was, I know I'm forgetting somebody. I had uh, Dweezil Zappa, uh, Steve Vai. Yeah, I forgot, the, like the most famous guitar player on earth. <laughs> so he joined us and hung out for well over two hours, and it was really transformative. You know, it's it's really different from just logging in to see a YouTube interview. Uh, when students can interact with him and he got really deep into philosophy and it was man it was just magical um then i had dweezil and the next one is going to be steve lukather coming up in a week um and he's got a brand new record out you know he's toured for years with ringo Starr. he's got a wonderful autobiography out called the gospel according to luke that's hilarious i mean he's he's hilarious and the only downside is i have my my first um like 14 year old and he has a potty mouth from hell <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna be bad <laughs> i've i've already warned the mothers and you might want to skip this one <laughs> gonna be there yeah but so that's what it is that sounds amazing and i've done the one back in february myself and connor our other teacher had an amazing time at it so yeah really you're doing a fantastic job putting it together teachers are amazing I want to come back to that in a while and find out more, but I wanted to ask you about your own teachers and your own learning. When you started playing the guitar, did you have any, who was your best teacher and um, how did they teach you? Well, that's a, a good, a good question because I, I started when I was eight years old and it was kind of odd back then, but my first guitar was electric. <clears throat> it was probably a piece of crap, but I didn't know any better at the time. And I was, uh, inspired, inspired from the Beatles. I was there when they came to America and, you know, one of the, one of the kids that was sitting in front of my black and white TV and my whole town was all about Beatlemania. So that was a motivator. Plus my dad was really into music, into jazz. So anytime he was home, that was a backdrop to my life was jazz during dinner, after dinner. Um, and at eight years old, the the first things I started to learn, I, reading, you know, the first three frets in a Alfred book or Mel Bay book, learning little melodies and learning how to read. <clears throat> and the family moved several times. And so every time I moved, I ended up with a different teacher. And the next teacher was a, a folk player. So that got my right hand together to do a little bit of finger picking. Next one was blues. Next one was rock. And fast forward up to when I, uh, I took a, a weekend symposium at Musicians Institute. And it was, I got into the third class they ever had. In the beginning, they were, they were doing these ads in Guitar Player Magazine to try to get the word out. You know, now it's world famous, but back then they, they were just hustling students. And so I drove up uh, like a hundred miles away to do this weekend symposium. Most of the stuff was way over my head. It was jazz theory and reharmonizing, and I'm like, you know, all of that stuff's over my head and on the splattered on the wall behind me. <laughs> and by the end of the weekend, I decided to to try to enroll, and I flunked the test to get in because one of the things I was asked to do was um, I'll never forget this because I was shocked that I was wrong. The, the guy said, "Play a G major seven chord." And the only G I knew that had a seven was a cowboy G7. And he goes, no, nah, you're not quite cooked enough. <laughs> so so he sent me back to San Diego where I was living, and I ended up studying with a, a monster bebop player named Peter Sprague. And that guy, you know, I, I, I have remorse that my 
my parents paid for lessons all those years and I never learned a diatonic scale. I mean, I had my blues scales and I'd play along with BB King records, but I didn't know a chord scale. I didn't know inversions. Um, he had me playing Chet Baker solos and Miles Davis and John Coltrane uh, um, and getting my diatonic scales together. So that was a really intense six months and then I was ready to get into the school. And even at that, I was the only student in the class of 60 that never did a live show before. So in part because my mother didn't want me to go out at night and play with strangers. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going. In fact, there there was a local uh, a local music shop I would go to, and I was so thrilled to find one day they had this Rolodex. I mean, this was way before smartphones. It was a physical Rolodex, and and musicians would write their name and phone number and what kind of music they were into, what kind of band they wanted to create. And I wrote down a bunch of names and took them home. And that's when my mother said, "No, nope, you're not going to go play with strangers." And so I was just a closet player for until I was 21 and I had had graduated Musicians Institute which was at that time just a guitar school GIT and my first gig I wanted to be a jazz player and the first gig was um, reading out of the real book with another guitar player which which the the one takeaway from that gig was you know he, he didn't even the other guy didn't know it was my first gig he probably would have been a lot more nervous had he known but we had practice for months. I would go to his house and we would read the real book. We'd be reading jazz standards. All of a sudden you have an audience and how boring is that to watch two people staring at paper? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that was a real shocker. And that's when I thought, you know, I really should be memorizing this stuff. So that, that lasted a while. And then I ended up in my, my first band it was actually a fusion band. Um, and I saw them live and I go, man, this band is the bomb. The bass player is obviously influenced by Jocko. And as soon as I got in the band, they had decided to become a cover band. So I show up with my Gibson Birdland to play Pat Benatar songs and, and police. <laughs> you know, <laughs> It's amazing. They, they let me be in the band, but <laughs> we, we all had some growing to do. So that's where I cut my teeth on stage was playing 80s covers. And as you can see, I've I've had a cup of coffee and I can easily motor mouth. So you're going to need a crowbar to get in there and ask me more questions. No, it's perfect. Love hearing about all that. Did you play like a lot live then after that when you started gigging? Did you perform a lot? Well, a lot meant weekends, really. Yeah. Friday, Saturday nights in, in local clubs and restaurants. Um, yeah, it, it was very consistent, though, for maybe... Three years, let's see, I graduated GIT in 79 and uh, played with that band three or four years. I ended up in L.A. Be because the bass player had moved up there. And it seemed like immediately he got a gig with Johnny Rotten in Public Image. And the rest of us were going, well, I want to be in a big band and tour. So one by one, we trotted up to L.A. and I ended up sleeping in his garage for several months, <laughs> and you know, to get my feet on the garage on the ground and it ended up being a security guard from midnight to eight and wow. trying to get enough students in the afternoon to make a living off of it. It was brutal. It was just brutal for several months. And, and then Scott Henderson went on tour and I ended up taking his place at GIT to, yeah. the, I mean, taking his place. I couldn't take his place musically, but there was a slot open, shall we say. And I had a class that was called open counseling, which pretty much meant that anybody that wanted to could come in and hang. And it was four hours twice a week. And every time I went home, I would think, I told them everything I know about music and there's not a drop left. And then two days later, I'd have to do it again. So I was always trying to learn new stuff. Satriani solos, Vi solos, Flexible had just come out at the time. And it, it was a real growth period for me as well, just trying to keep up with things to share. And was there like a kind of a culture there where people would talk about the teaching aspect itself, like not just the music aspect, or it was, was it just like, go and t do whatever you like? <laughs> well, well, th there was de a definite curriculum. 
for sure. I, I just wasn't teaching anything in particular. So it was just kind of a free for all extra that, that I was in for. I, I ended up doing more of a, a guided class too. I can't remember what that was called. And I remember I had to test people and there was some that obviously did not put in any work and it just crushed me to fail them. In fact, in fact, one guy just begged me not to fail him, and I just go, "Okay, what's it to me?" You know, it's like I, I don't think anybody has gotten a gig because of their diploma from music school, unless it's teaching. But as far as playing, it's what do you got? You know, do you fit in the band or don't you? So did you see like teaching as? always part of what you do like part of your profession is as a teacher the whole time or did it come and go over the years it came and went and it's really interesting because once i got out of the guitar school i started teaching right away and then when i got michael jackson I, you know i was off on tour for a year and a half and when i came back i was on three different tours with him when i came back i would teach at mi for a while um but I, I hadn't done one-on-one -on -one lessons for years and years and was lucky enough to make a living touring. Um, but, you know, it's feast and famine. Sometimes things are cool and sometimes there's months that go by and the phone doesn't ring and you go, oh, what am I going to do now? So there's been a couple spots where I did get to local music shops when I was home and I would teach. And it was it was actually, I felt like Rip Van Winkle because... When I had taught before, I'd spend a lot of time in the lesson writing things down. And now they're smartphones. And, and you can get so much more done. I go, okay, I'm going to play this thing, break out your phone, boom. And now that it's on Zoom, I just say, hit record. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's all there. I don't have to write anything out. Sometimes, having said that, I mean, sometimes I'll, I, I know I put way too much energy into lessons because sometimes I'll have a half hour student and spend the next 45 minutes after it gathering things I talked about. Oh, you got to hear this. I'll find this YouTube link and do this and write this out and find this track. And so um, that's just me. <laughs> have you have you found like that you have a particular learning style or your students have different learning styles? Like there was one conversation I had with Alex Skolnick, of the band Testament, and he said yeah. he, he'd learned like his teachers had taught him all the modes and all the different scales. And it, for years, he didn't understand it and couldn't make head or tail of it. But at a certain point, he heard when he heard it, it made sense to him because he had a learning style that was based on hearing things. Ah, OK. He couldn't understand it, like just the theory of it abstractly, whereas some people are really good at that. Yeah, you kind of have to meet students where they are. And that's one thing that's a, a benefit of teaching is it forces you to learn how to communicate. Because if you're trying to get something across and people are not getting it, not getting, not getting it, you've got to find another way. Sometimes it's visual. Um, and in fact, I, I have a, a handout that I do on uh, chord scales. And I put it in numbers this is this is how it goes and i'll put it in graphs and like three different ways to try to get them to understand how chord scales uh, where they come from um and sometimes it's just hopeless <laughs> 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 but you know i mean modes the whole thing of modes is daunting and one of the things uh, gretchen men who's been with guitar cloud symposium since the beginning she did a thing last time where she was talking about, she and Neely Brosh have these conversations about how they were taught and how they think how they were taught wasn't the best way. And she has this way where she talks about modes as major or minor. And I never thought about it like that. I mean, the Ionian mode, <clears throat> the Lydian mode, Mixolydian, those are major modes because they have major thirds. And the others are all minor with little variations. And that, to me, that's a really unique way to think about it. Um, but I mean, ultimately, I, I try to stress that arpeggio tones are the most important tones. In fact, that <clears throat> that's something that was taught when I went to GIT years ago. Was Don Mock was the teacher that said, when you're playing over a chord, 
The chord tones on the guitar should light up bright red, like these are the best. And then the scale tones should be maybe a dull orange. Those are all valid, but not as important as the bright red ones. And then the bad tones should just be black. <laughs> wow, that's great. That's a really interesting way of looking at it. Yeah, well, I mean, some, some people think in colors too, like Uli John Roth. He's, I toured with him a, a few years ago, and he's got the, uh, the Sky Academy. I, I'm not sure all that that's about, but he thinks of keys as colors. And I remember he said A minor is red. I, I never caught up with the rest of the colors, but, you know, it, it makes sense to me. There, I mean, it's frequencies, right? And yeah. frequencies can generate color. So any way you can get it in your brain, take it. That that kind of concept of learning where all the chord tones are, the arpeggios and all the scale notes in between, it takes a long time to get it all integrated and absorbed, right? So it's like if students are, uh, different students have different long-term goals, like some might want to be professional or semi-professional and some are hobbyists and will always play as a hobby. Yeah. Do you think there's any big differences in in what they should learn if they want to like learn and get really good at the guitar? Would you approach the same way teaching? <clears throat> well, I hate to should all over people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that does make a difference. If you're a hobby guitar player and you just want to learn tunes, there's nothing wrong with that. And you don't necessarily have a use for theory. If you want to be a pro and you want to get to a certain level, like you want to play in studios, well, reading is very important. Um, and in fact, you know, it was really interesting when I was at school, Tommy Tedesco, who, if people don't know, he was, he was, God, a ridiculous session guy, where he would do three or four sessions a day, every day. Uh, from the Beach Boys. There's a, a great documentary called The Wrecking Crew, and he was part of that. Um, there was a, a group of guys that would do all the sessions, whether it was the theme songs for all the popular TV shows or popular records. Those were the guys on everything. And he was part of the school uh, of GIT. Um, and I had a complete brain fart. I don't know where I was going with that. That happens. I go off the rails. <laughs> What was your question? If it comes back to you, just shout it out. I was asking. Oh, oh, uh, okay. Here's something he did that changed my life. You know, we're all thinking we don't know where we're going to end up with music. Maybe we'll be studio people. Maybe we'll do this, do that. He brought students two at a time, did not get permission, just brought us into his sessions. And the day I went, it was for, they were filming with a full orchestra for the Roots documentary, part two. And man, I'll never forget the feeling of walking past all the strings tuning up. It was glorious surround sound. And I mean, it was such an expensive session because they were all union players and you can't just spend three extra hours to learn stuff. You have to have the crack readers that can read it down correctly the first time. And we sat with him and saw the music. I mean, just reams of paper and he didn't come in till like bar 702, you know? <laughs> and it, it was frightening. I mean, they, they say that studio playing is 95% sheer boredom, 5% sheer terror. Like the triangle guy, he's got one hit in the whole song and if he's a beat off, in fact, they've put heart monitors on those guys and they see the heart just goes up like, oh, here it comes, here it comes. It's psh. Um, <laughs> And, and from that day, I decided I do not want to do this. This is, this is not me. I'd, I'd rather join the army. <laughs> <laughs> Put my life in danger like that. <laughs> so you decided you'd want to perform live more, be a performer. Yeah, I mean, I think probably most people are, are more into the creative side, either performing and whether it's covers or whatever, but for me, I, I get a lot more satisfaction out of creation, whether it's writing tunes or people send me tunes and I come up with parts. Um, 
in fact, this next uh, Guitar Cloud Symposium that's coming up April 16th, one of the modules I'm going to teach is from a record I just did. There was this woman contacted me from Sweden, said I got this new record, and she sent me the tracks, and it was almost like a blank canvas. I mean, she she did what nobody should ever do. She went in the studio, and she did the vocals live and guitar without drums. And then the drums had to match her, and, you know, it gets a little funky. <laughs> it gets a lot funky at times. <laughs> So this is this is what I was served, and she was a, a fan from years ago. So I, I didn't get any guidance. I, I, what, I'd got one suggestion when I turned something in. But basically, she's like, here, do what you will with it. And it was super fun because I had 100% creative freedom, and I would come up with hooks and solos and fills between the, the vocal parts um, and do what I could to try to bring the groove together, which was at bad points, it just wasn't going to happen. Um, but so the, the course I'm going to give on, on that particular thing, normally I'll, I'll have people play and I'll have support materials for arpeggios or whatever after the fact. This, I'm just going to give examples. Because in part, because when I was with Jeff Beck and we were in the studio, you know, you don't need another guitar player on a Jeff Beck record. And sometimes I would be in there for five hours go, why am I even here? I mean, I, I loved being in his presence and hearing his, of course, I mean, just hearing him play is, it doesn't get better than that. But as far as my own role, I would always question it, though I did play on the record. But there was always something that he would say during the day that was such a, a Zen piece of wisdom. I would go, ah, that's why I was here for six hours, because what he just said is so important. I will carry it with me for the rest of my life. So I, I think it's valuable just going through, here's what I played on this record, and here's why. Here's why I didn't play here. Here's why I, I did play here, and why I picked up a slide, or why I chose this sound and this pedal at this point to to add more texture rather than... You know, a lot of her stuff was distorted guitar and, and rhythm, just grinding rhythm, like stones kind of stuff. And so for me to come in and do a similar thing would be pointless. You know, I, I would do some clean sounds and swells and something to enhance it rather than stomp on it. <laughs> do you work on songwriting your own stuff regularly? I don't. You know, for <clears throat> for years I did. I put out three solo albums, and honestly, it's like giving birth to a rhinoceros. It's it's so <laughs> so difficult when you're in charge. There's so many decisions you make, um, from creation to recording to the mix, which is more stressful than anything because you could put ten years into a record, and the mix can destroy it in a in a week. So. Yeah, it's, you know, when the digital thing happened and everybody gets access to your music for free, I thought, why am I going to put $10,000 into a project and not get any of it back? It, it just doesn't make sense. You know, if I found me a sugar daddy, now nah, that might be another thing, but it's my money coming out of my pocket. And it's not pop music, it's instrumental music, so it's a niche audience. Um, so I, I haven't done that for a while. My last album, I, I don't even remember what year it was. It, it's been a while, um, but the, actually the last album was, uh, it was part my album by default because I was hired to fly to Chicago and play a few tunes with this great singer named Mark Scher, and the producer is Jim Peterick from the band Survivor, and I came in really well prepared. We, I, we knocked out, I mean, it was so prolific. We knocked out three songs in a day and a half, and the second day... He wanted to write one with me, which was kind of daunting because I, I don't consider myself a pop writer by any stretch. You know, my stuff is really out there. And, and we sat down and he goes, give me a riff. And so it started that way. And within an hour, we had a tune that made it on the record. And when I flew back, uh, maybe a month or two later, Mark called me up and, and wanted me to come and do some more. So after that, he called me up and said, you know, you're... Your guitar is, is like another voice on that record, so we want you to be a bigger part of it. So it's now called Cher Batten, 
and and the name of it is Battle Zone. Um, and it was great because I didn't know I was making a record. So I didn't have the pressure of all those decisions. And I came in in the last minute and just kind of decorated it like a session player, right? So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's... Is, there, is there anything from that you can play or, or something else that you wrote an original thing? Yeah, sure. Let me, mm, let me dig up something here. Uh, oh, crap. While you're, while you're getting ready there, if, if yeah. anybody has a question, there's a couple of questions in, I'll ask after we hear Jennifer play. But if you have a question, just What? Wait a minute. <laughs> I'm half baked here. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a, a track called Elephant Stomp. And I just, it, it's a, a lot of fourths and a lot of intervallics, which I'm really into. Cool. Just moving shapes around. And um, yeah, I'll talk about it after. Cool. See you on the other side. Oh crap, it went to another song. Ah. <laughs> Always be prepared. That's my <laughs> lesson for today. That's not that. Okay. <laughs>
That was amazing. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Sorry, I was I was futzing with the volume because that tune was actually a, a little different level than what we sound checked. <laughs> Came through but, well. Okay, it's amazing. Cool, cool, cool. <laughs> well, th that um, oh, you had you had asked if there was any p teacher in particular that I was really into, and Joe Diorio was the teacher at GIT that knocked my socks off. And one of the reasons was he was he was into wide intervallic skips, and he has a book that I memorized cover to cover called Intervallic Designs. And so instead of doing, uh, instead of doing normal lines, which uh, normal would be seconds and thirds, scalar kind of moves. You know, the, the, I'm I'm either. Most of them, <laughs> I'm not making any sense at all. Intervallics, I mean, interval is just the space between two notes. Um, when I say intervallics, I think of a fourth or higher. So doing lines that are like. A, a, giant steps. So that's what I was thinking of when I first started that tune. Um, it's kind of athletic with the right hand, but it's like if you get into it, it's kind of like the heavy bat method where, you know, you work with a heavy bat and then you go to the baseball game and get a lighter bat and you knock it out of the park. But... Um, I like to use fifths. I I see fifths. It's like that movie. I see dead people. I see fifths <laughs> everywhere around the neck. And I just like that sound. You think students should learn to play like the more seconds and thirds way before the wider intervals way? Did I learn to play that first, you said? Do you think students who are just learning to play, do you think they should learn... You know, oh yeah, yeah. Twice. Yeah, you you gotta have little successes, or you'll jump jump off a bridge. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> smaller. Yeah, S small chunks, bite-sized chunks. Learning cool. things and in, in manageable things. You know, yeah. If you're trying to learn a, a twenty-four bar song, start with four. Yeah. You know, even if it takes a week, so what? There's no rush to get to the other side. A few few questions coming in. Tommy asks. What's your favorite? Who's your favorite Irish guitarist? And, and, uh, and Gary Moore, Rory Gallagher. Oh, you know, I, I was a freak for Rory Gallagher. Yeah. In, in my teenage years, man, walk on hot coals, sleep on a bed of nails. There's an image. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, back in the day, back in my day, when we had full album covers, he had these big pictures and his guitar was so beat up. There was such a mojo in that such a vibe i was super super into him and having said that i i did get to see him play live once and it was one of the first live shows i went to rock definitely it was so loud i got physically ill and i had to leave it, it just made me nauseous <laughs> so that's a, that's a sad story isn't it um but you know who when i think of ireland i think of davy spillan the, the Irish pipes, I think, is one of the most supreme instruments out there. The way, I'm sure it's not bending, I don't know what they call it, but to me, to a guitar player, it sounds like bending into notes is just like, ah, I wish I could do that with guitar. It's beautiful. Yeah, I think he was, he the, called the nickname was the Jimi Hendrix of the pipes. I think it was Davy Spillane. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, another question in from Dara. What would is there any tip that you would give a hobbyist who's learning to play guitar? One tip. Feedback. We got Jimi Hendrix in the Zoom. <laughs> <clears throat> um. Well, I you know I think it's I think it's super important to have a teacher, and 
if you don't have any goals, the teacher is going to make goals for you. If you just want to learn certain songs, then bring them in. And one of the most valuable things that I turn people on to is an app called Transcribe. It's by a company called Seventh String. And you can find it at jenniferbatten.com, actually. But what it is, is a slow downer. And it does so much more. And I wish to God I had this when I was 12. It's it's as close as you can get to actually having the original masters of a record um, in that you can remove the vocals and put it in karaoke mode because what it does generally vocals are in the center track <clears throat> and in the stereo field if you put it out of phase then they will disappear now how much they disappear depends on how it's mixed sometimes they're gone completely sometimes you're you're still going to hear it in the reverb returns or something but uh, number one, that gives you the greatest backing track ever. Uh, and it's not just vocals, it's the lead instrument, whatever is in the center track. And there's one button, there, you can EQ it any way you want. You can push up the frequencies uh, to, ha to help you hear guitar better. The one thing I always do is there's some presets so you can get rid of the bass frequencies. Just boom, you see them all drop to the bottom. So you get that out of your way. You get the vocals out of your way, and all that's left is drums and guitar and keyboard frequencies. Um, and then you can slow it down. A and I have, man, I have... There's one gig I got where I was supposed to play these pretty quick lines with Jeff Lorber, the keyboard player and a saxophone player. And I got the sheet music, I got the audio, and I thought, great. I started working on it, and I go, uh-oh, this is not easy. And I literally took four bars at a time, slowed it down to 25% speed. I mean, a snail's pace. Because when you're learning stuff, there, there's a thing that happens with your brain. There's a synapse connection. And like the first time you play something, there's a connection. And as you do more repetitions, the connection gets thicker, physically thicker. So 40, 60 repetitions, you can think of it as go, going from the size of a hair to a string, to a rope, to a chain. And because of that, it's so, so important to take things slowly and get them accurate. Because what you're doing when you're learning music is you're programming this computer. So if you, if you go too fast and make mistakes, even if you get it 80% of the time you get it right and 20% you get it wrong, your brain just made two different folders with the right stuff and the wrong stuff, and your brain doesn't care what's right or wrong. You get on stage and it goes, oh, how about pull from the 20%? We haven't been there in a while. <laughs> <laughs> so, wow, so since, really interesting, fascinating answer. It, it well, it's it's changed the way that I learn music absolutely because I I drink way too much coffee and I want it done yesterday. You know, especially if I join a new band and I have a lot of songs to learn, I I want to get her done. But I know that I'm doing myself a disservice by repeating mistakes. On that note, I, I got three minutes left. I got to jet to something else. So any, any other questions, I'll try to answer them really quickly. A question from Sinead. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Jennifer. Can you hear me? Yes. You can hear me. Oh, perfect. Okay. Um, so um, first of all, I'm really excited. So I hope I don't fluff up my question. I remember you walking across the stage with your huge white hair and like Michael Jackson grabbing your leg and just dying and thinking, I didn't know girls could play guitar. So that's like, you know, huge moment for me. I was like, yes, I could play guitar. Um, so, but my question is more about you're, you're like, you're an artist, you've got amazing stage presence, you're very creative, uh, but you've also worked as a support for other acts. And do you find that you've ever been asked to kind of dim your light or that you, you have to pull back so it's not to outshine or like, how does that work when it comes to two big people on stage? I, I, I've never, that I remember, I've never been asked to tone down, but I'm very sensitive to why I'm there. And the band is there to support the star. In a case like Michael Jackson, it's like you, you take your orders, you do your best, and you're there to elevate him. Uh, it, it's not about, I'm here for solos. Um, I mean, even with Jeff Beck, I, I would have been perfectly happy to play rhythm guitar the whole time. He's the one that offered me some solos and some trades, and that was fine with me but I was there to support him. And it, like Michael Jackson, something like that, you wanna get the parts exact. People are used to hearing that record a million times. And so you gotta to try to get the tone that was on the record and the notes and you know get it really accurate. 
With Jeff, it's almost the opposite in that it's about improv and he wants to be fired up. Uh, if he hears it the same way every night, it's going to get old after a while. But if you throw him a curve, it's exciting and he can take it somewhere else. So it's it's knowing your place is really important. And there's been plenty of people that tried to get their ego in the way and they don't last. Um, for one thing, the artist can feel it. You know, that the energy, it, it's not in words um, or, or even in action sometimes, but it's the energy that you're putting out. Um, there's a... Uh, I'm not going to get it into stories. I'm not going to get into gossip. Uh, I got to go. Well, this was fantastic. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Well, really, how do we find out about Guitar Cloud Symposium, if anyone wants to know more about that? Yeah, guitarcloudsymposium.com. There's a couple of videos on the homepage. Our next thing launches April 16th. It's next, next Friday night. Um, and in between, every other month, we do a, a single-day deep dive and the next deep dive for the first time we're going to do a beginner's boot camp so if you know anybody that just you know in, in covid people bought 1000 guitars every day just from sweetwater.com so i know there's a lot of beginners out there so thanks so much everybody i really appreciate you um i normally i would hang out much longer but i no got problem. something else you got another interview have a good yeah. one Don't you okay see thanks you. Bye -bye. thank you cheers bye, -bye. Cheers, bye. thank bye -bye. you thank you mm -hmm.